السلام علیکم اینڈ ویلکم بیک ٹو دا سیکنڈ لیکچر آن ایکٹ فائیو آف پگ میلین بائی جی بی شاہ ان دا لاسٹ لیکچر وی ور ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ دا ڈسکشن اور پرابلی کوائٹ کال سم ڈسکشن بٹوین الائزا پکرنگ اینڈ ہیگنس وی آر پکرنگ سیز الائزا ٹو فار گیو ہیگنس on which Higgins uh, furiously responds by rising. He says, Forgive, will she, by George, let her go. Let her find out how she can get on without us. She will relapse into the gutter in three weeks without me at her elbow. At this moment, uh, when he says this, Doolittle appears at the center window with a look of dignified reproach at Higgins. He becomes slowly and silently to his daughter. Now his sudden ap- uh, appearance uh, from the, uh, the back of the window or the curtain is quite uh, interesting uh, because it creates a dramatic irony again in the, uh, in the scene because we being reader and we being the audience know that Doolittle is uh, overhearing everything that is going on between um, uh, Pickering, Higgins, Eliza and uh, Mrs. Higgins. So when he suddenly appears and he gives a reproach, um, a, 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 he gives a look of reproach uh, to Higgins, it seems quite uh, hilarious as well as uh, humorous. Okay, he sl- comes slowly and silently to his daughter who with her back to the window is unconscious of his approach. Now this is uh, something that is going to be very interesting. Pickering. He is incorrigible. Eliza, you won't relapse, will you? You won't relapse? That you won't go back to your own ways. Um, Higgins uh, claims that uh, without his help, Eliza will relapse into her, into her older ways of uh, speaking Cockney um, uh, dialect. But uh, Pickering is quite confident about Eliza that she, she won't uh, relapse. And he asks her, um, uh, he's incorrigible. Uh, Eliza, you won't relapse, will you? and Eliza says no not now never again I have learned my lesson I don't believe I could utter one of the old sounds if I tried and uh, when she makes this claim that she will not uh, produce those old sounds at that very moment do little touches her on her left shoulder she drops her work losing her self position utterly at the spectacle uh, the spectacle of her father's splendor ow oh. um He, and uh, then Higgins says, with a crow of triumph, Aha, just so, ow, 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 <laughs> victory, victory. He throws himself on the divan, folding his arms and spreading uh, arrogantly. Uh, spreading, uh, spreading, um, uh, spreading means... Uh, Uh, stretching and spreading his legs uh, carelessly. So um, before this, Eliza was making the claim that she will not utter those sounds uh, again. But the very next moment, uh, it proves uh, this prove uh, this comment proves uh, ironic when she utters the same old sounds. And Higgins uh, feels triumphant uh, over uh, over this. Too little then says, "Can you blame the girl? Don't look at me like that, Eliza. It ain't my fault." I have come into money, Eliza. You must have touched a millionaire this time, Dad. Do little. I have, but I am dressed something special today. I am going to St. George's Hanover Square. Your stepmother is going to marry me, Eliza angrily. You are going to let yourself down to marry that low common woman? Uh, Pickering, um, quietly. He ought to, Eliza, to do little. Uh, to do little. Why has she changed her mind? do little sadly intimidated governor intimidated middle class morality claims its victims won't you put on your hat eliza eliza, eliza and come and see me turned off see me turned off means that uh, your stepmother will not care about me when she is married to me eliza if the colonel says i must If the colonel says means that she uh, pays a lot of uh, regard to what colonel, uh, colonel, colonel Pickering says. I must, I'll, um, almost sobbing, I'll demean myself. Uh, demean myself to, um, demean means to lower one's dignity and get insulted for my pains like never. 
uh, like enough do little don't be afraid she never comes to words with anyone now poor woman respectability has broke all the spirit out of her um uh, all the spirits out of her means that middle class morality um uh, has its claims on that woman as well and she has to keep up appearances and she has to uh, behave like a respectable woman pickering squeezing eliza's elbow gently be kind to them eliza make the best of it eliza forcing a little smile for him through her vexation oh well just to show there is no ill feeling i'll be back in a moment she goes out do a little sitting down beside pickering i feel calm and nervous about the ceremony connell i wish you'd come and see me through it pickering but you have been through it before man you were married to eliza's mother delisha who told you that connell pickering well nobody told me but i concluded naturally no that ain't the natural way connell it's only the middle class way my way was always the undeserving way but don't say nothing to eliza she don't know i always had a delicacy about telling her um which means that uh, eliza is an illegitimate child of dolittle he never married his mother pickering um, and and this comment is also important because uh, 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 mar- marriage he says is a way of uh, middle class not his cl- not of his class pickering quite right we'll leave it so if you don't mind do little and you'll come to the church connell and put me through straight with pleasure as far as a bachelor can mrs higgins may i come miss mr do little i should be very sorry to miss your wedding uh do little i should indeed be honored by your uh, uh, condescension ma'am uh, condescension is a, a patronage or favor or graciousness and my poor old woman would take it as a tremendous compliment she has been very low thinking of the happy days that are no more uh, happy days uh, again this is um, an ironic comment mrs higgins rising i'll um, i'll order the carriage and get ready the men rise except higgins i shan't be more than 15 minutes as she goes to the door eliza comes in uh, hatted and buttoning her gloves i'm going to the church to see your father married eliza you had a, you had better come in the broom with me broom is a four wheeled closed carriage colonel pickering can go on with the bridegroom mrs higgins goes out eliza comes to the middle of the room between the central window and the autumn, uh, ottoman pickering joins her do little bridegroom what a word it makes a man realize his position somehow he takes up his hat and goes towards the door pickering before i go eliza do forgive him and come back to us eliza i don't think papa would allow me would you dad do little sad but make animus they played you off very cunning eliza them two sportsmen if it had been only one of them you could have nailed him you could have you could have nailed him means you could have entrapped one of them into being your husband but you see um there was two and one of them uh, chaperon uh, chaperon the other uh, which means escorted or protected the other you as you might say to pickering it was artful of you colonel but i bear no malice um i should have done the same myself i've been the victim of one woman after another all my life and again this is a humorous comment um and i don't grudge you to getting the better of eliza i shan't interfere it's time for us to go colonel i shan't interfere means uh, i shan't interfere it's time for us to go it's also ironic because he never does interf- um, interfere and uh, he is more worried about going and getting married so long henry see you in st george's eliza he goes out pickering coxing do stay with us eliza he follows do little eliza goes out on the balcony to avoid being alone with higgins he rises and joins her there she immediately comes back into the room and makes for the door but he goes along the balcony quickly and gets his back to the door before she reaches it higgins well eliza you have had a bit of your own back as you call it have you had enough and are you going to be reasonable or do you want any more eliza You want me back only to pick up your slippers and put up with your tempers and fetch and carry for you? 
Higgins, I haven't said that I wanted you back at all. Isa, oh, indeed. Then what are we talking about? Higgins, about you, not about me. If you come back, I shall treat you just as I have always treated you. I can change my nature and I don't intend to change my manners. My manners are exactly the same as Colonel Pickering's. So we see that uh, Higgins is an honest man. He is actually uh, what he says. That's not true. He treats a flower girl as if she was a duchess. Higgins. And I treat a duchess as if she was a flower girl. So uh, we see that only merit is important in Higgins' points of, uh, point of view. And uh, what matters for, me, for him is intelligence. Liza. I see. She turns away composedly and sits on the ottoman facing the window. The same to everybody. Higgins. Just so. Uh, Eliza. Like father. Uh, Higgins appears to be uh, at this moment a mirror image of Doolittle uh, to Eliza. Higgins. Uh, grinding. Um, Grinding a, a little, grinding a little, taken aback, uh, taken, uh, sorry, grinding a little taken down, without accepting the comparison at all points. Eliza, it's quite true that your father is not a snob. A uh, snob is the one who judges others by the amount of money they have, one who judges others by their social status. And that he will be quite at home in any station of life to which his eccentric destiny may call him eccentric in the strange and unforeseen circumstances, such as um, highly, uh, such as sud his suddenly becoming rich. Serious, uh, seriously, uh, the great secret, Eliza, is not having bad manners or good manners, or any uh, any particular any other particular sort of manners, but having the same manner for all human souls. In short, behaving as if you were in heaven, where there, uh, where there are no third-class carriages and one soul is as good as another. Um, uh, this is what we see at this moment, what actual Higgins is. He is, um, uh, he is as uh, careless in his speech with Eliza as he is with his mother. So when he talks about that uh, where there are no third class carriages, he uh, he is uh, talking about the fact that uh, he believes in a, in such a place where there is no division of class and rank. Eliza, hey amen. You are a born preacher. Higgins irritated. The question is not whether I treat you rudely, but whether you ever heard me treat anyone else better. Eliza, with sudden with sudden sincerity. I don't care how you treat me. I don't mind your swearing at me. I don't mind a black eye. Um, I don't mind a black eye. Black eye uh, means um, uh, refers to uh, a mark of dishonor. I have had one before this, but standing up and facing him, I won't be passed over. Passed over that I won't be neglected or ignored. Higgins. Then get out of my way, for I won't stop for you. You talk about me as if I were a motor bus. Eliza, so you are a motor bus. All, bu all bounce and go, and no consideration for anyone. Bounce, jump, or speed. But I can do without you. Don't think I can't. Higgins, I know you can. I told you, you could. So we see that. Um, Higgins here takes the entire credit for Eliza's transformation. Eliza, wounded, getting away from him to the other side of the ottoman with her face to the her, uh, to the hearth. I know you did, you brute. You wanted to get rid of me. Higgins, liar. Eliza, thank you. She sits down with dignity. Higgins, you never asked yourself, I suppose, whether I could do without you. Liza, honestly, don't you try to get round me. You'll have to do without me. Higgins, arrogant. I can do without anybody. I have my own soul, my own spark of divine fire. But with sudden humility, 
I shall miss you, Eliza. He sits down near her on the ottoman. I have learned something from your idiotic notions. I confess that humbly and gratefully. And I have grown accustomed to your voice and appearance. I like them rather, Eliza. Well, you have both of them on your gramophone and in your book of photographs. When you feel lonely without me, you can turn the machine on. It's got no feelings to hurt. Higgins. I can't turn on, turn your soul on. Leave me those feelings and you, you can take away the voice and the face. They are not you. So we find when he says leave me those feelings that he is rather sensitive. And uh, this, um, the, the emotional state that we see uh, of Higgins at this moment is very rare throughout the play. He never uh, reveals his emotional side, but at the moment we see uh, what he actually feels. So we, up till now, we have seen that Ella Higgins is more of uh, more a man of um, mind than a man of heart. But here he, we we see that he is sensitive too. Eliza, oh, you are a devil. You can twist the heart in a girl as easy as some could as some could twist her arms to hurt her. Mrs. Pierce warned me time and again she had wanted to leave you, and you always go got round her at the last minute, and you don't care a bit of her, and you don't care a bit of, a bit for me. So we see that Eliza uh, is comparing herself with Mrs. Pierce. That how um, uh, Higgins is finally. Um, successful in convincing mrs pierce not to go so he, uh, she says that uh, higgins should not believe that uh, uh, she is like mrs pierce so she has her own personality and she knows uh, uh, what decisions should she make okay higgins i care for life for humanity and you are part of it that has come my way and been built into my house what more can you uh, or anyone ask, Lisa, I won't care for anybody that doesn't care for me. Higgins, commercial principles, Eliza, like reproducing her Covent Garden pronunciation with professional exactness, swollen violet, selling violets, isn't it? Liza, don't sneer at me. Don't sneer at me. Don't ridicule me. Don't make fun of me. It's mean to sneer at me. I've never sneered in my life. Sneering doesn't become either the human face or the human soul. I'm expressing my righteous contempt. Contempt um, uh, is uh, when he says, I'm expressing my righteous contempt for commercialism. I don't and won't trade in affection. And here we see that Higgins has become the mouthpiece of Shaw. You call me a brute because you uh, you couldn't buy a claim on me by fetching my slippers and finding my spectacles you were a fool i think a woman fetching a man's slipper is a disgusting sight did i ever fetch your slippers uh, uh, so we see that uh, Higgins, Higgins only goes with the logic, no sentimentality. We uh, we see that uh, though uh, Higgins has sentiments, but he is not sentimental. I think a good deal more of you for throwing them in my face. No use slaving for me and then saying you want to be cared for. Who cares for a slave? If you come back, come back for the sake of good fellowship, for you'll get nothing else. You have had a thousand times as much out of me as I have out of you. And if you dare to set up your little dog's tricks of fetching and carrying slippers against my creation of a duchess, Eliza, I'll slam the door in your silly face. So we say here, uh, Pygma um, uh, Higgins behaving uh, as Pygmalion, the creator. Eliza, what did you do it for, uh, for if you do, uh, didn't care for me? Higgins heartily. Why? Because it was my job. Eliza, you never thought of the trouble it would make for me? Higgins, would the world ever have been made if its maker had been afraid of making trouble? Making life means making trouble. There is, there is only one way of escaping trouble and that's killing things. Cowards, you notice, are always shrieking to have troublesome people killed. Eliza, I'm no preacher. I don't notice things like that. I notice that you don't notice me. Higgins jumping up and walking about intolerantly. Eliza, you are an idiot. I waste the treasure of my Miltonic mind by spreading them before you. Once for all, 
understand that I go my way and do my work without caring two pence what happens to either of us. I'm, I'm not intimidated like your father and your stepmother. So you can come back or go to the devil, which you please. Okay, when uh, he says my mil Miltonic mind, uh, it refers to the mind that is stored with knowledge and noble ideas like John Milton. And um, it, is also, uh, it also refers to um, the illusion that is being used here, Eliza. What am, what am I come back for? Higgins, bouncing up on his knees on the ottoman and leaning over it to her. For the fun of it. That's why I took you on. Liza with averted face. And you may throw me out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to? Higgins, yes, and you may walk out tomorrow if I don't do anything you want me to. Liza, and live with my stepmother? Yes, or sell flowers? Oh, if I only could go back to my flower basket. I should be independent of both you and father and all the world. Why did you take my independence from me? Why did I give it up? I must live now for all my fine clothes. So we see that um, when she says, uh, I am a slave now, uh, she finds herself a misfit just like Alfred Doolittle feels himself. And this is basically um, what Shaw uh, um, is uh, sh trying to show the uh, in terms of class clash. Higgins. Um, not a bit. I'll adopt you as my daughter. Um, and settle money on you if you like. Or would you rather marry Pickering? Liza looking fiercely, uh, fiercely round at him. I wouldn't marry you if you asked me. And you are nearer my age than what he is. Higgins gently. Then he is not than what he is. So we see that basically um, uh, Higgins is a professor of fanatics. And, uh, uh, and he is uh, a professor to the marrow of his bond. Uh, he does not believe in his romantic idealism. Um, which is, uh, I remember because romantic idealism is far from his personality. Even at this moment, he uh, does not forget to correct Eliza. When he corrects um, her saying, then he is not than what he is. Eliza losing her temper and rising. I'll talk as I like. You are not my teacher now. Higgins reflectively. I don't suppose Pickering would, though he is as confirmed an old bachelor as I am, Eliza. That's not what I want. And don't you think it? I have always had chaps enough wanting me that way. Freddie Hills. Freddie Hill writes to me twice and thrice times a day. Sheets and sheets. Higgins disagreeably surprised. Damn his impudence. He recoils and finds himself sitting on his heels. Eliza. He has a right to, if he likes, poor lad, in, and he does love me. Higgins getting off the ottoman. You have no right to encourage him. Every girl has, uh, then Eliza says, every girl has a right to be loved. Higgins. What? By fools like that? Eliza. Fred is not a fool, and if he's weak and poor and wants me, maybe he would make me happier than my betters that bully me and don't want me. Higgins. Can he make anything of you? That's the point. Eliza. Perhaps I could make something of him, but I never thought of us making anything of one another. And you never think of anything else. I only want to be natural. So we see um, uh, that uh, uh, she clearly refuses to go back to uh, Higgins and Pickering by, uh, uh, by giving uh, the reason that she may uh, in future marry Freddie but this statement also shows that she is quite uncertain about her uh, relationship with uh, Freddie and uh, she has no definite idea uh, in her mind regarding uh, her future with Freddie Higgins uh, in short you want me to be as infatuated about you as Freddie is that it L Liza no, I don't. That's not the sort of feeling I want from you. And don't you be too sure of yourself or, or of me. I could have been a bad girl if I'd liked. I've seen more of some things than you for all your learning. Girls like me can drag gentlemen down to make love to them easy enough. And they wish each other dead the next minute. So when she uh, refuses, um, uh, when she says no to Higgins, uh, this refusal does not mean that she is being cockwed. The, the idea of being cockwed cockwit is the is the one that we find in the rape of uh, rape of the lock she's not saying no for the saying uh, for the sake of uh, saying no rather she actually means it she's actually refusing higgins higgins 
Of course they do. They what? Then what in thunder are we quarreling about? Eliza, much trouble. I want a little kindness. I know I am a common ignorant girl. And you a book learner gentleman. But I am not dirt under your feet. What I done? Correcting herself. What I did was not for the dresses and the taxes. I did it because we were pleasant together and I come. Came. To care for you, not to want you to make love to me and not forgetting the difference between us, but more friendly like. So we see that uh, Eliza is still in the process of learning language. She uh, sometimes, uh, 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 she is not as fluent uh, as, uh, as, as she is pretending. And uh, this also proves Higgins' point that without his help, she may relapse into her older ways. Higgins. Well, of course, that's just how I feel and how Pickering feels. Eliza, you are a fool, Eliza. That's not a proper answer to give me. She sinks on the chair at the writing table in, tear, in tears. Higgins. It's all you'll get until you stop being a common idiot. If you are going to be a lady, you'll have to give up feeling neglected if the men you know don't spend half their time sniveling over you. Uh, sniveling over uh, means complain in tearful way. And the other half giving you black eyes. Uh, uh, if you cannot, if you can't stand the coldness of any sort of life and the strain of it, go back to the gutter. Work till you are more a brute than a human being and then cuddle and squabble and drink till you fall asleep. Oh, it's fine life, the life of the gutter. So squabble uh, here means no noisy call about something um, very trivial. You can feel it through the thicker skin. You can taste it and smell it without any training or any work. Not like science and literature and classical music and philosophy and art. So these five very important disciplines, science, literature, classical music, philosophy and art. This is what defines the character of Higgins. You find me cold, unfeeling, selfish, don't you? Very well. Be off with you to the sort of people you like. Marry some sentimental hog. Hog is swine or other um, with lots of money and a thick pair of lips to kiss you with and a thick pair of boots to kick you with. If you can't appreciate what you have got, you'd better get what you can appreciate. So we see that um, uh, uh, as they are talking, their uh, conversation is getting harsh. Eliza, desperate. Oh, you are a cruel man. I can't talk to you. You turn everything against me. I'm always in the wrong. But you know very well all the time that you are nothing but a bully. You know I can't go back to the gutter as you call it. And that I have no real friends in the world but you and the colonel. You know well I couldn't bear to live with a low common man after you two. So this statement is also very important. It is a hint as well that she may not get married with Freddie. Because after um, uh, after meeting with uh, Higgins and Colonel, she, uh, there is a set standard in her mind. And uh, Freddie uh, does not meet that standard. And probably for this very reason she may not marry him you know well i couldn't bear i couldn't bear to live with a low common man after you too and it's wicked and cruel of you to insult me by pretending i could you think i must go back to the imposter because i have nowhere else to go but father but don't you be too sure that you have me under your feet to be trampled on and talked down i'll marry freddy so again uh, uh, in the uh, previously she has been uncertain but here she's making this statement i'll marry freddy i will as soon as he's able to support me so uh, we see this turn of mind um, in itself uh, represents a confused state of mind of Eli eliza higgins sitting down beside her rubbish you shall marry an ambassador you shall marry the governor general of india or the lord lieutenant of ireland or somebody who wants a deputy queen i am not going to have my masterpiece thrown away on fairy so here pygmalion the creator is speaking in his persona eliza you think i like you to say that but i haven't forgot what you said a minute ago and i won't be coxed round as if i was a baby or a puppy if i can't have kindness i'll have independence higgins independence that that's middle class blasphemy blasphemy is um, a violation or something profane we are all dependent on one another every soul of us on earth eliza rising determinedly 
I let you see whether I'm dependent on you. If you can preach, I can teach. I'll go and be a teacher. Higgins, what you'll, what will you teach in heaven's name? Eliza, what you taught me, I'll teach fanatics. Higgins, ha ha ha. Eliza, I'll offer myself as an assistant to Professor Napion. Higgins, rising in a fury. What? The imposter? Imposter? Uh, pretender. That humbug? Um, that toting in ignoramus? Uh, toting means flattering and ignoramus is uh, the one who is ignorant. Teach him my methods, my discoveries. You take one step in his direction and I'll wring your neck. He lays hands on her. Do you hear? Liza defiantly, non-resistant. Ring away. What What do I care? I know you'd strike me someday. He lets her go, stamping with rage at raving for, and at having forgotten himself and recoils so hastily that he stumbles back into his seat on the ottoman. Aha! Now I know how to deal with you. What a fool I was not to think of it before. You can't take away the knowledge you gave me. You said I had a finer ear than you and I can be civil and kind to people, which is more than you can. Aha, that's done you, Henry Higgins. It has. Now I don't care that. Snapping her fingers. Okay, now I, I don't care that. For your bullying and your big talk. I'll advertise it in the papers that your duchess is only a flower girl. That you thought that she'll teach anybody to be a duchess just the same in six months for a thousand guineas. Oh, when I think of myself crawling under your feet and being trampled on... And called names when all the time at I had only to lift up my finger to be as good as you, I could just kick myself. So we see that this is the difference between Higgins and Eliza, and uh, we see that Eliza, though, is the uh, is the uh, creation of uh, uh, Higgins, uh, the Pygmalion, but she is not the typical mythical uh, Galicia. She has her own personality. She is a living being. Higgins wondering at her, you damned impudent slut. But it's been, but it's better than sniveling, sniveling, weeping and uh, sobbing, crying. Better than fetching slippers and finding spectacles, isn't it? Rising by George, Eliza. I said I'd make a woman of you, and I have. I like you like this. So he is also getting uh, Pygmalion. Um, um, Higgins the Pygmalion is also getting happy for Eliza for this transformation, for this metamorphosis. Eliza, yes, you turn round and make up to me now that I am not afraid of you and can do without you. Higgins, of course I do, you little fool. Five minutes ago you were like a milestone round my neck. Around my neck. Um, uh, it is a simile and um, uh, which we, uh, milestone means um, a burden round my neck. Now you are a tower of strength, a consort battleship. Consort battleship, a suitable wife. You and I and Pickering will be three old bachelors together instead of only two men and a silly girl. Mrs. Higgins returns dressed for the wedding. Eliza instantly becomes cool and elegant. Mrs. Higgins. The carriage is waiting, Eliza. Are you ready? Eliza, quiet. Is the professor coming? Mrs. Higgins, certainly not. He can't behave himself in church. He makes remarks out loud all the time on the clergyman's pronunciation. So we see that Higgins cannot control himself. Being the professor of fanatics, he's always observing the dialects, the accents and the pronunciation of people. Eliza, then I shall not see you again, professor. Goodbye. She goes to the door. Mrs. Higgins, coming to Higgins. Goodbye, dear. Higgins, goodbye, mother. He's about to kiss her when he recollects something. Oh, by the way, Eliza, order a ham and a Stilton cheese, will you? And buy me a pair of reindeer gloves, number eight, and a tie to match that new suit of mine. At Eel and Benman's, you can choose the color. 
His cheerful, careless, vigorous voice shows that he is incorrigible. So uh, he is still hoping that uh, Eliza would come back to um, uh, to Pickering and Higgins. And there are reasons uh, for such a hope because um, uh, in the beginning we uh, in the beginning of this act we have seen that Eliza is the one who pays much regard to what Pickering says. Uh, she never um, uh, she never um, goes against what Pickering says out of respect so um, uh, and moreover we also have witnessed in act 5 that uh, Eliza is not certain about her marriage um, uh, with or about her wedding uh, with the uh, um, Freddie. So there, these assumptions, these uh, hints can be taken as um, uh, as a, as a signal that Eliza may go back to Higgins and Pickering. Eliza disdainfully, buy them yourself. She sweeps out. Mrs. Higgins, I am afraid you have spoiled that girl, Henry. But never mind, dear. I'll well, I'll buy you the tie and gloves, Higgins. Sunnily. Oh, don't bother. She'll buy him all right enough. Goodbye. They kiss. Mrs. Higgins runs out. H uh, Higgins left alone. Rattles his cash in his pocket. Chuckles. Uh, chuckles means uh, laugh quietly and um, inwardly. And sports himself in a highly self-satisfied manner. Uh, and the success of Pygmalion uh, that he has created a woman out of nothing and uh, uh, chuckles that inward, inward uh, laugh that uh, feeling of satisfaction also uh, gives a hint that probably Higgins is satisfied and he's happy with the fact that El he has turned Eliza an ordinary flower girl into a real woman of strength but probably he is uh, he's assured as well that Eliza is never going to come back so uh, this self-satisfied manner is uh, is more a hint of his success being Pygma uh, being Pygmalion than uh, the than being uh, hopeful uh, of uh, Eliza's coming back. Here uh, the ending is important in in, in its sense because um, we have seen um, that the play uh, play is uh, the subtitle of the play is that it's a romance in five acts uh, five acts. Uh, but uh, is whether it is a romance or not we need to see uh, because um, uh, uh, though that subtitle says that it is a romance but uh, we, we see that there is no union between the hero and the heroine of the or the main characters of uh, the play so uh, the subtitle seems to be ironic as well as it's uh, the play seems to be anti-romantic like uh, Shaw's another play Arms and the Man uh, so here the play ends and uh, uh, to this uh, act later on Shaw added the epilogue in which he talks about uh, what happens after Eliza leaves so in that epilogue it is being narrated that uh, Eliza later on gets married with Freddie and she uh, spends a very um, ordinary life with uh, with uh, Freddie uh, having lots of financial difficulties in which Pickering uh, uh, time and um, time and again he keeps on helping both of them uh, so uh, that is all about act 5 now we try to um, uh, look at some points uh, that this uh, that uh, that need to be discussed so let's start it So uh, we start with the discussion about the setting and uh, we'll be talking about in act uh, about act 5 in particular and, and that of uh, about and that about act 1 2 3 and 4 in general so we see the settings and that in act 1 the setting is Covent Garden at 11:15 p.m. in act 2 it is the next day 11 a.m. Higgins laboratory in Wimpole Street in Act 3, it is Mrs. Higgins at home day, her drawing room in a flat on Chelsea Embankment. In Act 4, the, Act 4, the Wimpole Street Laboratory, midnight, it is a summer night. And Act 5, Mrs. Higgins' drawing room. So Act 2 and Act 4, uh, 
um, here we have the same setting and in act 3 and in act 5 we have the same setting and and both uh, um, these settings uh, laboratory and at Mrs. Higgins both these settings uh, show the setting of um, of upper class in the society whereas act one represents uh, a place where the people from all classes have gathered and simply um, uh, it happens on account of the rain but what is important to see in all these settings is uh, that who shows up where and So uh, the important thing to see is who shows up where and how one is treated. Uh, then we see uh, the, this is the overall uh, view of uh, Act uh, 5 Acts. Uh, we see that in the first act, the characters are Higgins, Pickering, Eliza, Mother, Daughter, Freddy, the bystanders. Uh, we see that three major characters and uh, um, a, a very important minor character Freddy is being introduced in act one in act two uh, Higgins Pickering Mrs. Pierce Eliza and Alfred Doolittle in act three Mrs. Higgins Henry Higgins Pickering Miss Ainsford Hill Mrs. Ainsford Hill Freddy and the father maid in act four uh, which is the climatic uh, act we have uh, only three major characters Higgins, Pickering, and Eliza. In Act 5, that we have just finished, we have the parlor maid, Mrs. Higgins, uh, Professor Higgins, Pickering, Eliza, and Alfred Doolittle. Okay, so if we talk about uh, the structure and synopsis of uh, the play, uh, you can see in the last row the synopsis. Let's uh, talk about this point first. Uh, Act 1 Higgins, Pickering, and Eliza they uh, come in contact with each other in Act 1. In Act 2, Eliza, uh, Eliza uh, reaches uh, Higgins' laboratory of fanatics just to learn, um, uh, learn proper language. In Act 3, Eliza, we see that uh, she's been through her successful trial at Mrs. Higgins um, uh, and, uh, and, um, and she's been successful at Ambassador Party. Um, act 4 uh, represent, uh, represents the disclosure and Act 5 we see a very changed, uh, a new Eliza, Eliza the Galatea confronts Higgins, the Pygmalion of the play. Uh, so if we talk about the structure of the play, um, a critic um, divides five acts into three acts. He says that uh, the five acts of Pygmalion can be called uh, or can be converted into three acts uh, play structure. He takes act one and act two as an exposition. And uh, um, uh, why exposition? Because uh, the two acts show uh, the process of transforming a flower girl into a duchess. Act three and act four, they represent a situation, a situation where, um, where an artificial duchess is, uh, uh, is created uh, with parrot-like talk and in act 5 uh, we see that the entire play moves towards discussion and uh, we see that Eliza has gained the ability to articulate her thoughts so uh, let's talk about characters of the play we start with uh, the uh, very important character a major character um, in the play Henry Higgins we see that he's a devoted professor of fanatics and uh, he remains so throughout the play. Uh, we are focused on Act 5, please keep this a point in mind. And um, his habit of swearing, it, re it remains intact throughout the play. He is short-tempered and is uh, an irritable. And uh, we see that uh, these are his um, characteristics, but he remains true to his nature. He is what he is and he remains the same so for, so uh, for this very reason though he is a flat character but this is again Shaw's achievement that he makes and he creates such a masterpiece uh, out of a flat character uh, like Henry Higgins so Henry Higgins also remains the source of humor in the play 
um, and um, we see that uh, he is a person who has qualities both of head uh, and heart. Uh, Lewis Crompton says about the character of Higgins, he says, Higgins is in many ways a paradoxical being. He is at once a tyrannical bully and a charmer, an impish schoolboy and a flamboyant wooer of soul, a scientist with an extravagant imagination and a man so blind to the nature of his own personality that he thinks of himself as timid, modest and diffident. So that, that, is, that is very true. And um, uh, in all the extremes, we see um, in Higgins characters most prominent, prominently in Act 5. So we here move to the character analysis of uh, Eliza Doolittle. Uh, uh, since she is a character uh, who has many dimensions to her characters, like Higgins, she is not a flat character. She is a person who has ability to grow, who has ability to transform herself. So I have simply picked, um, I picked some um, quotations, some lines from each act just to show uh, how uh, this transformation takes place. In Act 1, we see that she's so full of self-pity, she says, poor girl hard enough for her to live without being worried and shivered bothered and harassed so she's so um so, uh, so full of self-pity for herself uh, so, uh, so, so she's so um uh, see she, she is all the time seeking sympathies in act two uh, we come to know that she's a uh, she's a girl who knows her mind though she is poor but she knows um, uh, what she wants in life she has taken this decision to come and to um, learn language and change her life she says I want to be a lady in a flower shop instead of sitting at the corner of Taunton Court Road but they won't take me unless I, I can talk more gently okay in act 3 uh, we see that uh, uh, she wins the bet for Higgins and Pickering and Pickering praises her saying you have won the bet 10 times over in act 4 uh, she for the very first time uh, appears to be such a miserable figure when she raises questions in front of uh, Higgins uh, she says what am I fit for what have you left me fit for where am I to go what am I to do what's to become of me so this is the beginning of a new person, a new personality where she is able to think, she is able to question about herself. And in Act 5, we see that she is a, uh, she is a woman who has self-respect. And uh, she very clearly says the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she is treated. What's matter? Okay, and the next character is Alfred Doolittle. We see that he is a great source of humor and he always gives a very timely appearance. Um, and his physical appearance is uh, important both in Act 2 and in Act 5. And uh, in both these acts, he is treated differently simply because of his social status. And uh, we see that uh, he um, is a confirmed blackmailer. He uh, remains happy in his poverty, but he is more hostile towards middle class morality uh, he moreover is a complete failure as a father and uh, he hates the idea that uh, he is no more an undeserving poor and uh, again a very the very important dramatic purpose um, Alfred Doolittle serves in act 5 is um, his ironic that he, he he provides an ironic comment on Eliza's metamorphosis on Eliza's transformation so uh, let's have uh, a look at some similarities and some differences between Eliza and Doolittle uh, there are uh, we try to draw a parallel between these two characters so we see what are the similarities we see that both have acquired new identity um, both have raised in social status both hate snobbery Snobbery, like uh, snobbery is when you um, uh, give more respect to a person on the amount, on the basis of the amount of money one has. Uh, both are unwilling to accept each other. Both think Higgins the cause of their problem. And this is humorous as well. And the difference between uh, the father and the daughter is that Eliza likes her new identity and loathes to go back to her reality, whereas Doolittle is nostalgic about his past. Eliza is more confident and happy after realizing her true self, whereas Doolittle is dissatisfied. 
Eliza provides seriousness in Act 5, whereas Doolittle is a constant source of humor in Act 5. Eliza is able to bridge the social gap through language, whereas Doolittle is able to bridge the social gap through will. So we see that language is very important in bridging this social gap. Uh, the next character is uh, Colonel Pickering. Uh, we see uh, the, his friendship with Higgins. He is a, he is uh, uh, known for his generosity. And the very important dramatic purpose he serves is his uh, role as a foil to Higgins. He is act, uh, obviously what Higgins is not. Uh, when Eliza says, in Act 5, it's not because you paid for my dresses, I know you are generous to everybody with money, but it was from you that I learned really nice manners. And that is what makes one a lady, isn't it? We really come to this point where one thinks that who is actual Pygmalion for Eliza, it's Pickering or Higgins. The next important character is, though a minor character, uh, is Mrs. Higgins. Uh, she says uh, she is the voice of reason she represents victorian morality we find him uh, we find her an affectionate mother and she's a compassionate listener she is as attentive to uh, pickering as she is uh, she is as uh, attentive to alfredo little and eliza as she is to her son and pickering and she is kind and sympathetic to all so very quickly, we see what dramatic techniques are being used. Uh, we see uh, right in the beginning, I talked about the element of suspense. Then uh, there is this use of dramatic irony. And when Higgins does not know that Eliza is upstairs, then uh, the abundant use of irony in Act 5. Um, Higgins' uh, joke about Alfred Doolittle being moralist, it proves a practical joke and uh, Alfred Doolittle because of his silly joking becomes a rich man. Then another instant of irony is when Doolittle replies with melancholy resignation that now he is expected to provide for everybody. Uh, another technique that is being used is the use of reparty that is the quick intelligent reply and uh, 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 this uh, technique uh, Shaw puts in the mouth of uh, Alfred Doolittle who provides humor in Act 5. Um, uh, Alfred Doolittle also um, uh, uh, provides comic relief when the discussion between Eliza and uh, Higgins uh, becomes quite serious. His sudden appearance, uh, uh, right back. Uh, um, his sudden appearance from uh, the back of the window uh, provides the comic relief, and it shifts uh, the conversation to a more uh, to a more comic note. And we see that there are uh, there is a use of paradox that is again associated with the character of Alfred Doolittle. Uh, the major theme that that are being um, discussed in the in act five is middle class morality that is mainly represented by alfred Doolittle, and uh, the next theme is transformation which is mainly represented by um uh, eliza and as well as uh, by alfred Doolittle. and uh, with this is an associated theme of uh, identity and identity crisis uh, because it is eliza who feels herself nowhere. To some extent, Alfred Doolittle uh, feels the same. And one important theme that is good moral, morals versus bad morals. And this is a, well, this is one of the consistent themes in the play. And right from the uh, from Act One uh, till very end, we see that there is this debate of morals and language. Obviously, that is the major theme, as well as the motif in the play. Okay, about the ending. Um, um, so, um, a critic uh, talks about the ending of the play in these words. He says, however, Shaw realizing the importance of an ending. So, because we have seen that in Act, uh, act 5, is sort of an open-ended. And uh, it does not provide a definite resolution. So, um, here is the quotation that 
comments about uh, its ending. However, Shaw realizing the importance of an ending does provide a resolution in the epilogue. The drama lies neither in the conflict nor in the discussion or the exposition. The conflict itself arises over the issue of the resolution of the, prob uh, of the problem. The conflict arises mainly in Act 5 where, um, I repeat uh, this line again, the conflict itself arises over the issue of the resolution of the problem because Act 5 offers um, uh, this arousal of the discussion and uh, Shaw is famous for um, a theater of ideas as you know. Unless there is a resolution, there is no drama for the action remains incomplete. Action always has to be completed either comically or tragically. Hence, in the epilogue, Shaw resolves the issue by making Eliza marry Freddie Hill. And um, I end my discussion with uh, the quotation by G.B. Shaw himself. Uh, what he says about his plays being didactic, he says, I wish to boast that Pygmalion has been an extremely successful play all over Europe and North America as well as at home. It is so intensely and deliberately didactic and its subject is esteemed so dry that I delight in throwing it at the heads of uh, Weizsäckers who repeat the parrot cry that art should never be didactic. didactic. It goes to prove my contention that art should never be anything else this is the bibliography uh, you can note down it for the future references that's all